closer Leo gets to the herd, the more his attention turns from motion to sound. Unts have nostrils and lungs, but they also inflate secondary air sacs on both sides of their bodies. Unts are named after the sound they make when they exhale through their dorsal vents. Like buffaloes on Earth, the unts are competitive, possibly fighting for domination of the herd. Something spooks the herd. Leo senses movement nearby, but can't get a fix. His sensors are simultaneously scanning in all directions, looking for the strongest signal. The newest input comes through Leo's microphones. A pair of bladder horns compete. Bioluminescent antlers are displayed to scare off opponents. racket from this jewel might have spooked the unts. Leo interprets the back and forth bellowing as a form of communication. Perhaps this alien grump is smarter than it looks. Leo deploys the Earth communication screen. Like a greeting card, it's the best hello we can offer. But if the bladderhorn is saying anything, it's probably telling Leo to get lost. Bladderhorn cuts and runs as Leo's sensors detect another disturbance. For the next 24 hours, the Von Braun makes several attempts to communicate with Leo, but gets no reply. A grim dispatch rides a laser beam to Earth. Probe Da Vinci has gone offline. Cause unknown. Ike and Leo's programming would be different uh, so that they would respond differently. You have a chance of one of them responding in a situation that may not be the best response to that situation, may put the probe in danger. By having the two probes carry separate software, you have a chance to have one survive where another one might fail. The unths are interesting in that they occur in, in herds or, or groups. Uh, this is one of the Darwin four animals that we see where there is the evolution of sociality, social groups, which is also very important and evolved evidently many times on Earth. These animals are interacting with each other in a number of sophisticated ways, probably both to establish pecking order within the, uh, the herd, and even though we're not sure uh, what's a female and what's a male in the unths at this point, certainly the kind of interactions we're seeing with these animals are very similar to males fighting for females that we see on Earth among herding animals. The bladder horn is a very interesting animal for a variety of reasons. One thing that's a bit unexpected is that the bladder horn is the only animal we've seen so far that in fact appears to use sound as a major means of communication. It's taking some of the features we would expect to see, that is, display features that would be used in competition. We see these animals interacting front to front. Probably these, these uh, horns with the bladders are fundamental in the way they interact with each other. Next, Ike confronts a forest vampire. 
and a living earthquake rocks the surface of Darwin IV. On an alien planet, a forest encounter is a near disaster for Ike. When we do make contact with an intelligent life form, they may be descended from predators. Take a look at our animal kingdom. We have foxes, lions, and tigers with stereo eyes to the front. And then we have rabbits and deers with eyes to the side. That's because the predators have to zero in on the prey. They, are, they have cunning. They have stealth. They know how to ambush. Well, if you're a rabbit, all you have to do is know how to run. So which is more intelligent, the fox or the rabbit? Well, obviously, the fox is more intelligent than the rabbit. So chances are, when we meet intelligent life forms in outer space, they're going to be descended from predators. Unless he resumes transmitting again, Leo is virtually an invisible dot on a vast alien landscape. Leo's twin probe, Ike, soldiers on. He finds another pocket forest, the living remains of woodlands that thrived until Darwin's oceans evaporated and the climate changed. As Ike begins to scan the trees, his sensors pick up something new, lurking on a high branch of a plaque bark tree. Scientists will call it the dagger wrist for good reason. When Ike launches a camera disc, the dagger risk is not interested in posing. The dagger wrist's forelimbs sink so deep, the nutrient rich sap bleeds to the surface. Ike's not programmed to approach something this aggressive. That was Leo's job. The study of plant life is Ike's mission, until von Braun orders otherwise. Finding water is statistically the most efficient method of finding vegetation. Ike scans a carpet of moss at the edge of a deep water marsh. But what lies beyond it is even more intriguing. Ike surveys three odd mounds covered with saplings. But appearances are deceiving on Darwin IV. Rising five stories into the air is a massive paradox. The Grove Back. Grove backs bury themselves alive for long periods of time. They're not hibernating, they're feeding. Grove backs absorb nutrients from the soil through the skin of their underbodies. When the ground's depleted, they move on in search of new feeding areas. 
Groves of trees sprout from these immense creatures. The grove pack provides them water from its spongy tissue. The trees inject sugars into the grove pack. Just enough juice to jumpstart these titanic walkabouts on Darwin IV.